watching the National News Desk, America's News Now. They get no favors from this administration. A major reckoning on the issue of immigration, the action Trump's border czar says he'll take immediately. Uh, people may be experiencing um, uh, confusion or misunderstanding or even potentially fear. Uncertainty leads to fear as Americans turn to the Internet for answers. The impact a second Trump presidency could have on some women. I feel we're sort of in a crisis in health care for staff um, in general, particularly in nursing. Growing pains as America ages, the strain on hospice is getting worse. The action needed to stop the care crisis. From the nation's capital, this is the National News Desk, America's News. Now, I'm Dee Dee Gatton. Thank you for joining us on this weekend edition. We take a look at the big headlines of the week and we look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following this week. Here at home, Americans reacting to Donald Trump's return to the White House, the top issues that gave him a second term. Abroad, the election results resound on the world stage, the potential impact on the wars in the Middle East and Ukraine. And control of the House goes to Republicans. The GOP now in control of Congress and the presidency and later choosing his cabinet, the household names and the wild cards joining the Trump team. Israelis are celebrating the new president elect Donald Trump and what his return to office could mean for Gaza and the West Bank. The Biden administration has been pushing for Israel and the Palestinians to agree to a two state solution, a view not shared by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. But Trump's nominee for ambassador to Israel wants Israel to expand and opposes the idea of Palestinian statehood. Mike Huckabee, the former governor of Arkansas, has made comments like this in the past. Uh, there is no such thing as a West Bank. It's Judea and Samaria. There's no such thing as a settlement. Their communities, their neighborhoods, their cities. Uh, there's no such thing as an occupation. Trump hasn't stated his Israel policy for a second term, but he's supported Israeli settlements in the West Bank in the past. Meantime, the White House is trying to send Ukraine as much aid as possible before President-elect Donald Trump is sworn in. This as speculation swirls about how Trump will fulfill his campaign promise of ending the Russia-Ukraine war right away. He hasn't said how he'll do it, but the Biden administration worries he'll leave Ukraine to fend for itself. President Biden fully intends to drive through the tape and use every day uh, to continue to do what we've done over these last four years, which is strengthen this alliance. And officials worry how Trump will handle the NATO military alliance. In the past, Trump has suggested that NATO countries don't contribute as much to their militaries as the U.S., calling it unfair. We are starting to get a clearer picture of the major changes ahead in the name of securing the border and the U.S. homeland. National correspondent Christine Frizzau with what we're learning. We are migrants. We are not criminals. Chants from members of a group of 2,500 people from more than a dozen countries. Their destination? the United States border. She says they left because there is no work in their country, no solutions, following in the footsteps of so many before her, heading toward a country in the midst of a major reckoning on the issue of immigration. We will liberate our country from the illegal alien drug dealers, robbers, murderers, gang members, and child predators and we will make America safe again. Donald Trump's key campaign promises centered not only on stopping migrants from coming in, but removing those already here, part of a mass deportation plan his future border czar says will begin immediately. ICE is very good at what they do. We have a targeting system. Criminals and gang members, they get no favors from this administration. You came to this country legally, which is a crime. You committed crimes against the United States citizens, some heinous crimes. You get no grace period, so we're coming for you. To help carry out that mission, Trump has now chosen South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem Hello, everybody. to serve as Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. President. Leaders in Democrat-run cities and states promising to push back. If the Trump administration requests it, would the Massachusetts State Police assist in mass deportations? No, absolutely not. You come for my people, you come through me. This is a sanctuary city. 
Those laws are in place. Those sanctuary laws expected to be a major target over the next four years. With laws in place in 11 states plus the District of Columbia, the borders are, Tom Homan, warning those who don't help to get out of the way. Donald Trump once again threatening to cut federal funding. I'm Christine Frizzell for the National News Desk. The Air National Guardsman who admitted leaking national security secrets is sentenced to 15 years in prison. The Massachusetts judge punished Jack Teixeira this week on the harsher end of the range agreed to in a plea deal earlier this year. Teixeira used his top secret clearance at the Otis Air Base on Cape Cod to write down and photograph hundreds of classified documents. He then posted them online. Three Iraqi men who were tortured at Baghdad's Abu Ghraib prison over two decades ago have been awarded $42 million by a federal jury. A lawsuit was filed against Virginia-based defense company CACI Premier Technology in 2008. The plaintiffs alleged the company was hired by the U.S. government to provide interrogation services following the invasion of Iraq and that CACI breached international law by deploying guards who tortured prisoners. But the company's lawyer blamed instances of abuse on U.S. military police and a handful of bad apples. The company is reportedly planning to appeal. Drug overdose deaths dropped again this year. The CDC released data this week showing a 14% decrease from the year before. 45 states reported a drop. Overdose deaths spiked during the pandemic and are still higher than pre-COVID levels. Not yet clear what specifically is driving the dip, but one researcher says the declining numbers appear to be sustained, giving way for hope. Online searches for topics related to women's health have spiked since the November 5th election. Searches for IUDs, birth control pills, and Plan B are trending higher than in June 2022 when Roe v. Wade was overturned. That's according to new Google data. The National News Desk, Jeff Harris, has more. Health and law experts I spoke with say since the election last week, there's been growing uncertainty of what women's health will look like in a second Trump term, so many are now turning to the Internet for answers. Catherine Drabiak, a public health expert, believes uncertainty following the presidential election is playing a big role in this surge in online searches. Trying to figure out um, how that candidate uh, that candidate's policies will impact kind of life as we know it right now. According to Google data, searches for IUDs, birth control pills, and Plan B are trending higher than in 2022 when Roe v. Wade was overturned. People may be experiencing um, uh, confusion or misunderstanding or even potentially fear. During a TV interview with a Pittsburgh TV station back in May, President-elect Trump was asked if he supports any restrictions on a person's right to contraceptives. Well, we're looking at that, and I'm going to have a policy on that very shortly. Trump later took to Truth Social to clarify his position, writing, quote, I have never and will never advocate imposing restrictions on birth control. But Alicia Hughes, a law professor, believes many are feeling anxious and nervous, which is why searches are growing. So women are looking at what is the landscape for my health care? But she recommends paying extra attention to where you're getting your information. Let's make sure that when you're looking at things, these are reputable sites with reputable reporting. As president, Trump would have the authority to order rollbacks of measures put in place by the Biden administration protecting birth control. He could also work with Congress to enact legislation on women's reproductive rights. I'm Jeff Harris reporting from Washington. Skipping essentials to keep up with finances. A new survey by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau found 30% of federal student loan borrowers have gone without food or medicine due to monthly bills. CFPB surveyed more than 3 thousand people with an active or recently active student loan account. 38% of borrowers say they carry credit card debt as well. 44% say the debt stalls them from buying a home and 26% push back starting a family. Vice President Kamala Harris and President-elect Donald Trump received celebrity endorsements in this year's election. Janae Bowens with the Fact Tech team joins us now to discuss the impact of the celebrity endorsements. Janae, so this go around the biggest names, at least associated with Harris, didn't appear to make much of a difference. Exactly, Dee Dee. The biggest stars like Beyonce, Taylor Swift, and Bruce Springsteen backed Harris. Now Harris paid a huge price for events with A-list celebrities. One example is an event with Oprah Winfrey. Now, I 
I got my hands on FEC filings showing the Harris campaign made two payments of $500,000 to Winfrey's production company. Now, Variety reports Winfrey was never paid directly by the campaign. The money was used for production costs associated with the town hall held in September. That million dollar effort didn't work. What changed this election cycle? Yeah, so I like how an analysis from the New York Times puts it. She couldn't get the endorsement of the Teamsters, but she got the endorsement of Hollywood. That's a tough message for a lot of voters. It was a show of dazzle in an election where clearly people were not looking for dazzle. Now, Dee, Dee we know the economy was the top issue for voters. People are looking for lower grocery prices and celebrities didn't necessarily help to champion that issue. Yeah, it's interesting analysis, Janae. Thank you. Janae will be back in just a few minutes to discuss the celebrity endorsements that actually did work. Coming up next here on the National News Desk, America's News Now. Silent struggle, the Marine veteran raising awareness for the men and women in uniform struggling with PTSD. He received the Medal of Honor in 2009 after saving the lives of Americans and Allied troops in Afghanistan, the first living U.S. Marine to receive the highest military award in more than 40 years. Today, Dakota Meyer continues serving our country, giving children of Marines educational scholarships. He's partnering with the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation to create the If You Can, You Must campaign with the goal of raising $2 million for scholarships for the children of Marines. Here's his conversation with our Jan Jeffcoat earlier this week. I know you were in New York City earlier this week as the Grand Marshal of the Veterans Day Parade there, and you are an outspoken advocate for veterans struggling with PTSD, having struggled with it yourself. How widespread is this among our veterans, and how are you doing with it right now? I mean, look, I'm great. I wake up and live the best day of my life every day. And you know, what I want to point out is this is not something that's just unique to our veterans. Uh, obviously, our veterans are struggling from it, but this is something that is is in every one of our households. It's in all of our communities. This is not just this unique to the veteran community. I mean, everybody right now is struggling with something. You know, America needs hope more than ever. And so, you know, my, my mission to go out and to continue to push on for veterans and to continue to use my platform for the greater good is is as high as it's ever been to, to want to go out and make a difference in this world. Yes, yeah, is so true. You're right. It is in all of our households. Uh, the Pentagon released a study that did show soldiers. This is a very sobering statistic right here. Soldiers right now more likely to die from suicide than any other cause. What did you find helped you w when you came home from war and, and really what helps you every day? You know, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think the biggest thing is the biggest misconception that we have with when it comes to PTSD, depression, anxiety, is it's painted to all of us as if it's like a terminal illness. Once you get it, you're just going to have it forever. You know, I know that there were many times early on in my struggles with mental health that, that you know, there were days I felt like that, I, I you know, this was the rest of my life. This was going to be my forever, and this was going to be all of my tomorrows. And it wasn't until I took back control of my life. I actually just put out a book a couple days ago uh, called Why to What, which is it's a simple blueprint plan to how I deal with all my struggles and how I take back control of the situations that I can't control. Um, and, and it's really just a simple mindset piece. And I'm not I'm not de demising it, but but it has to start with us. And, and you know, I, it wasn't until I looked in the mirror and I started understanding the power of my thoughts and the way that I talked and who I spent my time around yep. was ultimately going to get me out of that and give me control to be able to go get the help with the resources that we have today. That's so awesome. I love to hear that. And I, and I love that what you're doing right here. You, you are continuing to serve our country with this educational scholarship fund. Why is this so important to you personally? Well, personally, it's so important to me because, well, first off, I'm a Marine, right? And, uh, you know, I, um, 
you know, the Marine Corps and the Medal of Honor has provided me a platform to do good. And, you know, I teamed up with the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation to start the If You Can, You Must campaign uh, in order to raise $2 million uh, for Marines' children. Because to be honest, every country I fought in, every every argument that you get in, everything, every piece of hate is stemmed in a lack of education mm. or weapons education. And so for me, when I look at, at any place that I've ever gone, being educated on a topic or being able to have a way to be to understand how to educate yourself uh, is truly the biggest power that all of us have as human beings. And so being able to invest back in the next generation of especially our service members and especially our Marines is something that's very, very important to me in order to be able to, you know, put, put a legacy in for this next generation. Yeah, knowledge is power for sure. Talk about why this is specifically critical to provide these opportunities for children of Marines. Yeah, you know, look, you know, when you look at the demographic of human beings that raise their right hand and serve this country, you know, our families of serving, you know, of service of, of our military are the greatest human beings our country has to offer. And to be able to go and educate them and be able, like, this is not, this is not a charity. This is an investment. This is an investment into the future of America. It's an investment into the future of the Marine Corps. It's an investment into the future of, of for all of us. And so, you know, being able to go and tr to help educate the men and women who have already shown that they want to serve and that they love this country and that they're patriots, uh, to be able to educate their children to continue that service and to continue the leadership across the globe is something that is so important to me. You've partnered with the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation, the country's oldest and largest scholarship provider for military children. I read that they have provided more than 60,000 scholarships since 1962. That is very admirable. Your goal is to raise $2 million. How can someone watching from home right now help your organization accomplish this? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the best way to go learn more about it is uh, mcsf.org forward slash if you can, you must. You know, it's not about just donating. It's about getting the, the word out there. Look, if you're looking at, you know, the, the if you can, you must campaign is wrapped around. If you can help somebody, you must help somebody because not everybody has the ability to help that person. And it doesn't mean just donating you know spread it around let people know about it not just to let them know to donate but let them know that this is a resource for marines families that's out there right i mean it's if you can you must we got to stop walking past problems that we can fix we've got to be unconditional in a conditional world and that's what this whole campaign is about it's about raising money and investing in the future of the best our generation has to offer well i, I certainly hope you, you make that goal and, and you reach it very quickly Again, an honor to talk to you this morning. Best of luck to you, United States Marine Corps veteran and Medal of Honor recipient, Dakota Meyer. Thank you for joining us Thank here on the so National much. News Desk. We appreciate it. Such an important mission. We're glad to hear about it. Up next here, the CDC warning of an increase in measles cases within the U.S. What you can do to protect your kids. Plus, chaos in the crowd. The fans facing charges after a seating squabble sparked an all-out brawl at a hockey game. This is the National News Desk, America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From a doctor arrested in Maine to a fight breaking out at a hockey game in Florida, we're taking the pulse of America, but we start in Washington State where medical officials are seeing a surge in whooping cough cases. 
If you haven't seen a child or a neonate with whooping cough, it's, it's quite terrible. And right now, 12 infants in our state under the age of one are hospitalized because of whooping cough. That's bad enough, but the numbers statewide are staggering. This time last year, 51 whooping cough cases. This year, the number is flirting with 1,200 and climbing. Shock. I was shocked. That's a huge jump. The highly contagious bacterial infection has hit 31 of the state's 39 counties. You should get your booster if you're due, and you should make sure that your kids are up to date on their vaccines. And if you're pregnant, you should get a Tdap during pregnancy. And know the symptoms. It's similar to other respiratory illnesses, low-grade fever, feeling unwell, runny nose, nasal congestion, and a whoop cough sounding like this. <laughs> Pensacola police say historically there hasn't been a big problem with fights at the base center, but at last Friday's Pensacola Ice Flyers game, it was an all-out brawl. Hey! Pensacola police say it's unclear right now who threw the first punch, but say someone sitting in someone else's seat is what started the argument that led to the fight. This video going viral on Facebook captures part of that argument. Shortly after, the pushing and shoving begins. Not too long after that, punches start flying. You even see one man seemingly leap from over the seats to hit another man. At least five people were involved in the violence. So far, two people involved have charges of array and simple battery pending. The owner of the Ice Flyers releasing a statement addressing the incident on Friday, saying in part, violent and disruptive behavior at Ice Flyers games is intolerable and not permitted. Today, the doors were locked and the lights were out at Dr. Peter O'Donnell's family medical practice in Yarmouth. The same was true at ANV Massage, which police say served as a front for prostitution. It's so sad, and we have to do something about it because I think it's very challenging to get out once you're in that situation. Krista Johnson was shopping with her daughter a few doors down from the parlor, where police say they've identified two suspected victims of human trafficking. Investigators allege Dr. O'Donnell recruited and employed individuals to perform sexual services for clients. Police charged him Thursday with sex trafficking after serving search warrants at both the massage and medical businesses. It's horrific, and the more we can do to stop it, not only here in Maine, but nationwide, is obviously what we need to do. I think it's it's definitely leaves a, um, a big dent on, on the, the, the rest of their lives. Still ahead here, the hard to get health care that will soon cost even more. The group seeing a 6% increase in their premiums in just a few months. To an important health alert now, seniors will pay more for health care in the new year. This week, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services announced premiums for its Part B plan will increase by about 6%. The standard monthly premium for Part B enrollees is currently $174.70 in 2025. That number will increase to $185. The annual deductible will also see an increase. The U.S. population is aging and the need for hospice care 
is growing. But staffing shortages could put the level of care in jeopardy. The National News Desk, Angela Brown, is looking into the staffing crisis. Hospice care in the spotlight due to former President Jimmy Carter turning 100 while in hospice care for over a year. Still a trailblazer. The former President Jimmy Carter making history once again, this time as the oldest person to get nominated for a Grammy. A 2024 report found that the U.S. hospice market size is expected to reach $65 billion by 2030. Growth tied to an aging population and more acceptance of hospice, but with growth comes growing pains. Do we have the staff for this? I feel we're sort of in a crisis in healthcare for staff um, in general, particularly in nursing. That crisis is trickling down to hospice care. Aaron Hausch, the CEO of Good Samaritan Hospice in Virginia, is facing a shortage of nurses and nursing aides. You know, we are limited in the number of patients that we can accept under our care based upon our staffing. Now, we will always make it work, and here at Good Sam, we always have done that. Hospice provides end-of-life care to patients and comfort to family members. Hiring can be tough. It's a job not everyone can handle. And then there's cost. I think the other thing that's plaguing people across the country, particularly in healthcare, is a growing, um, a growing cost of doing business, right? Um, people expect more when it comes to wages and all those things than they've ever expected before, but not necessarily a growing reimbursement. The Population Reference Bureau says the number of Americans 65 and up is projected to increase from 58 million in 2022 to 82 million by 2050. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. The at-home genetic testing company 23andMe is laying off about 40% of its workforce as part of a restructuring. The preventative health company also announcing it's discontinuing further development of all its therapeutics programs. The company expects the cuts will save more than $35 million annually. Ahead in our next half hour, controversial cabinet. A look at the picks President-elect Trump has made for his new team. Plus, picking up the pieces, Democrats disappointed after VP Harris's loss. Which parts of their strategy didn't go as planned? You're watching the National News Desk, America's News. Now, you can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. You're watching the National News Desk, America's News Now. Your money is being wasted, and the Department of Government Efficiency is going to fix that. Streamlining the system, the pair Trump has tapped to lead the newly minted Department of Efficiency. Plus, closing the border, the immigration policy changes Trump is vowing to make 
in his return to the White House. And later, power of a podcast. Why some analysts believe a well-known talk show helped shift the outcome of the election. From the nation's capital, this is the National News Desk, America's News. Now, I'm Dee Dee Gatton. Thank you for joining us. And this weekend, we are looking ahead at the transfer of power between President Biden and President-elect Trump. Right now, Washington, D.C. is preparing for the upcoming presidential inauguration. The D.C. mayor's office says it has reached out to President-elect Donald Trump's transition team to get to work on the specifics. She says they're committed to the smooth, peaceful celebration of the transfer of power, planning for the big event began in the summer. Metro Police is looking to have 4,000 officers on hand and insist they are prepared. The department is tracking at least four major First Amendment events between now and then. President-elect Donald Trump says he'll cut wasteful spending in his administration, and he's leaving it up to influential MAGA voices to figure out what to cut. National correspondent Matt Gelka has more on the new Department of Government Efficiency. Donald Trump says tech billionaire Elon Musk and former Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy will streamline government. Trump named both men to lead the newly minted Department of Government Efficiency. They've both been making promises on the campaign trail. The second mass deportation we really need is millions of unelected federal bureaucrats out of the D.C. bureaucracy. That is how you save a country. Your money is being wasted and the Department of Government Efficiency is going to fix that. We're going to get the government off your back and out of your pocketbook. The acronym DOGE, or DOGE, is a nod to a dog-themed cryptocurrency. Streamlining government has been attempted before, but it's unclear if the pair's recommendations will have any teeth. It is true that there is a history of government having big commissions and commission reports end up just collecting uh, dust on shelves and not enacted. So that is always a risk, uh, but we've got to keep trying to reform this massive government, which spends over $6 trillion a year. It's more than likely Congress will have to play a role. Republicans are always eager to cut costs, while Democrats are skeptical a full teardown can keep the country running efficiently. I don't think there's any question we have a, a debt crisis in this country. We're $35 trillion in debt. Uh, we cannot sustain that. It does not mean it's all going to go into effect. It's recommendations. Congress ultimately has the power of the purse. Congress will make the final decisions. Can we do things to make sure that we're being more responsive? Absolutely. But this idea that we're going to come in, blow it up, and then think we're going to keep serving the people is very unrealistic. Ramaswamy and Musk will have until July 4th, 2026 to make their recommendations. And from there, it'll be up to those on Capitol Hill to decide what to do with the advice. In Washington, I'm Matt Gelka for the National News Desk, America's News Now. There was heightened interest in leaving the U.S. following the election. Relocation tech company Move Buddha analyzed Google data trends and found searches for how to move out of the country surged 800 percent from November 5th to 6th. Texas led the charge. Top destinations searched included the United Kingdom and Italy. Both offer financial relocation incentives. An estimated 5.5 million Americans live abroad. The Transportation Security Administration is proposing new pipeline and and railroad cybersecurity rules. TSA issued several rules in the aftermath of the 2021 ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline. The attack took many gas stations along the East Coast offline. The new proposal would cement the plan, including requiring pipeline owners to report cyber incidents to regulators within 24 hours after identifying an attack. This week, the man accused of killing 22-year-old nursing student Lakin Riley waived his right to a jury trial. Jose Ibarra will instead have a bench trial, meaning a judge will decide his guilt or innocence. Ibarra is a Venezuelan citizen who entered the U.S. illegally in 2022. He's now charged with malice murder. The student was found dead in February near a lake on the University of Georgia campus, sparking debate over immigration reform. The border crisis was one of the top reasons why voters said they wanted Trump back in the White House. Now they're getting a clearer picture of how immigration policy will change under his second term. Joining Jan Jeffcoat to discuss is former acting commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, Mark Morgan. Trump's promised a closed border and mass deportations with an early focus of removing illegal immigrants who have committed crimes. 
What does this plan look like? And what about those sanctuary cities that do not cooperate? First, Kim, good morning. It, it, that's just going to be part of a multi layer strategy. They're really going to focus on three elements. One is the security of our physical border to stop the bleeding of illegal aliens, crimes, uh, uh, criminals, and drugs, and now security threats from pouring in. The second element, as you said, is going to be interior enforcement. So those that do get through our frontline defenses, uh, they're going to have to know that they're not going to remain here, that they're going to be removed. And the last leg of that is going to be to go after the cartels. As far as the physical border, we're going to implement the same policies that he did during his first uh, Trump administration that were found to be very successful. And that's going to be really, it's going to fall under the umbrella of consequences and deterrence. And we're going to use policy and resources to do that, like the Remain in Mexico program, ending catch and release, as well as giving technology and personnel, and of course, constructing the wall. As far as interior enforcement, Jan, it's, it, it wasn't so serious. It's the hysteria and fear mongering is almost laughable. We've been removing illegal aliens for the past four or five decades. Under the Clinton administration, we removed 12 million illegal aliens, and they've been doing it ever since. ICE ERO does this every single day, including under the Biden Harris administration. The only difference is what I would suggest is we're going to induce a what I call a whole of government steroids to just increase the magnitude and capability of those removals. And at the end of the day, sanctuary cities. They have to end if we're going to be successful. And to everybody watching, the, the common sense aspect of sanctuary cities is you have a criminal illegal alien in your city. They've committed another crime. And what your leadership is saying is we're, it's okay to release them back in your community rather than working with ICE to remove them. That's insane. That's going to end. So how can you force this? Would you withhold funding from these sanctuary cities? Yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in the, the policy that can be done, but that's just the basic common sense uh, strategy. It's kind of like the highway, right? National speed limit. Uh, they're they're going to say, look, states, you're going to do this because this is a common sense public safety issue. And if you don't, we're going to use every capability within the law to force you to apply this common sense strategy in, in sanctuary cities. So I hope the Trump administration uses every tool at their disposal, every lawful tool at their disposal to once and for all in sanctuary cities. The former head of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Tom Homan, now the new border czar, South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem, expected to be confirmed as Homeland Security Secretary. What can we expect from both Homan and Noem, and what would you do day one if you were in charge? First, Jan, I, I think the selection itself is very important. And when it was made, uh, first of all, he created a former borders czar position when under the pre previous administration, that was held by the vice president of the United States. Mm -hmm. So that's sending a strong message of the equivalency there. And then he actually nominated and selected the border czar before the secretary of state, before the secretary's treasury, before the secretary of defense. That's sending yeah. a very powerful message, how important it is for this president and that what he was saying on the campaign wasn't just rhetoric to, to get his base fired up, is that he's really going to carry forth with what he promised he was going to do. And of course, Tom Holman is, is, is an is a obvious pick for that. Now, now you know, Governor uh, uh, Nome, she was a little uh, a pick, I think, from the left field. She's going to have a tough job in front of her. That's a big department. But I think if surrounded by the right people, uh, they can be very successful. And on day one, it's pretty straightforward. Declare a national emergency in the use of the CBP-1 app, in the unlawful use of parole, start building the wall, reinstitute the remaining Mexico program and safe third country agreements, and of course, issue a mandate that ICE conducts the largest removal operation we've seen. That can be done on day one. Very quickly, you had a significant role with the FBI as well as former Acting Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection in, in two different administrations. Over the past four years, the GOP has said the FBI and the DOJ have been politicized and weaponized to go after government rivals. We saw the story that just broke last night. The home of the founder of Polymarket had been raided. He, he has a betting platform that predicted a Trump win, and he says this was obvious political retribution by the outgoing administration. Do you think the FBI needs an overhaul? And what do you make of some of these FBI investigations, Mark? Yes, clearly there has to be change in the FBI and there has to be significant change. There is unquestioned that the majority of the public have lost trust in the Department of Justice and the FBI. And the leader, look, I still believe that the majority of rank and file are still in the FBI wanting to do the right thing for the right reasons. I believe this is a leadership issue. How far down in the chain of command is yet to be seen, but that's the fact. And this leadership has chosen, rather than just be honest with the American people and address their concern, they have developed a, a bunker-like mentality. And at times, a bizarre approach to actually attack and go after the naysayers, go after the people that have questioned them in a defiant, again, bizarre uh, ways at times. 
I've seen Christopher Ray get angry when they question him over January 6th. I just didn't understand that instead of just uh, uh, you know addressing and talking about those concerns. So at the end of the day, if they're going to regain the, the America's trust in their agency, which they need, there's going to have to be significant change. At the bottom line, they just have to get back to the basics to protect the American people. Former Acting Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection and Visiting Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, Mark Morgan. Great seeing you, sir. Thanks for joining us. You bet. Thanks. Vice President Kamala Harris earned Hollywood's endorsement, but it wasn't enough to defeat President-elect Donald Trump. The Fact Check team's Janae Bowens is back. So how significant were Trump's celebrity endorsements in help, uh, helping him win? Yeah, Dee Dee. So analysts believe Joe Rogan helped Trump win. Rogan has the number one podcast with more than 18 million subscribers on YouTube alone. Many of his fans are young men. Now, Trump sat down with Rogan last month for a three-hour chat. The Hollywood Reporter says that might have been far more effective than having Hollywood stars on stage and in ads, particularly when trying to court voters in the crucial Rust Belt Blue Wall states, Harris declined an interview with Rogan. So not just who, but also how they approach these celebrity endorsements. Yeah. How impactful have they been in the past? Yeah, so they can help, especially if you are as popular as Oprah Winfrey. A study from the Journal of Law, Economics, and Organization suggests Winfrey's endorsement was responsible for approximately one million additional votes for Barack Obama. Now, back then, eight million people watched her daily talk show, and it's estimated that 16 million people read each issue of Oprah magazine. But Didi, what worked back then doesn't work now. Winfrey, Taylor Swift, and Beyonce backed Harris, but it wasn't enough to secure a win. All right, Janae Bowens, thank you. And for more on this Fact Two Team topic, including links to their sources, scan the QR code on your screen or visit thenationaldesk.com. Still to come, our team of correspondents breaks down this week in Washington from Trump's cabinet picks to a renewed interest in the COVID pandemic. And welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day, and our team of correspondents reports on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. President-elect Donald Trump building out his new administration this past week, announcing several cabinet nominees, some of which are sparking major controversy. National correspondent Matt Galka, you've been following Trump's picks. Who's getting folks riled up, and how are Republicans reacting? Yeah, Steve, I think we'll start with the safe pick here, and that's Florida Senator Marco Rubio, um, picked by Trump to be the Secretary of State. It's speculated that not only would he sail through a nomination process, but he'd likely get a lot of Democratic support. Um, he, being Secretary of State and, and diplomacy and foreign relations is something he's been a little bit of an expert in since he uh, joined the chamber, and he has a lot of respect from uh, his colleagues across the aisle. Now, some of the other picks. Pete Hegseth, a, a military man who's now a uh, Fox News anchor, or was a Fox News anchor, tabbed to head the Department of Defense. A little bit of a shocking pick. Tulsi Gabbard, former Democrat, now MAGA star to be an uh, Intelligence Department director. Um, a little more of a shocker there, but the, I think the biggest shock is uh, Congressman Matt Gates, or now former Congressman Matt Gates, to be Attorney General. He resigned. Uh, he is facing uh, an ethics investigation uh, where there are allegations that he had an inappropriate sexual relationship with a 17 year old girl. He was investigated by the Department of Justice, the department that he might very well head up if he does get through the nomination process. That pick is the most surprising to a lot of Republicans on Capitol Hill, and a lot of them are kind of wait and see right now, maybe not outright saying he's not going to get through it, uh, but at least some former Republicans are saying he definitely won't make it, including one of his arch rivals, uh, former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Gates led the ouster of him. McCarthy says there's no chance he's going to get nominated, and uh, so we'll have to wait and see, but that was one of the more shocking picks to folks on Capitol Hill. Yeah, traditionally cabinet nominees, a lot of scrutiny from the opposite party. It seems like with people like Gates and Hegseth, maybe some scrutiny from within the president's party as well. Meanwhile, Democrats are still picking up the pieces after the Republican sweep of the White House, the Senate, and the House. Uh, National correspondent Kayla Gaskins, what has been some of the fallout from the Democratic losses? 
So, see, this is what typically happens when a party loses an election. They go through a postmortem. They analyze where some missed opportunities might have been, what they could have done better. And now what's coming out is perhaps one of these missed opportunities was Kamala Harris choosing not to go on Joe Rogan's podcast. The show is wildly popular among young men, and that's a demographic she did not do well with uh, in November. Joe Rogan did come out uh, last week, and he said that her, Harris's team that she did not go on the podcast because she didn't want to talk about marijuana, specifically her prosecutions of marijuana. She put about 1,500 people in jail, is what Joe Rogan said, uh, for marijuana charges. And they were worried that this would not play well with the progressive wing of Harris's party. And she really needed that base if she was going to have a shot of winning in November. But meanwhile, Democrats are also just having a really hard time, some of them, settling and understanding what exactly happened. Steve, and this is leading to a phenomenon that's being dubbed Blue Anon. It's a play on the right-wing counterpart QAnon, a string of conspiracy theories as to how Donald Trump won this election. This goes back to the summer uh, with some of those uh, allegations that perhaps uh, the assassination attempt was faked. A lot of uh, people online are going online and saying that maybe that wasn't real. And it also goes down to votes. Um, there's a whole group of people online that also believe perhaps Elon Musk and Starlink was able to go in and, and manipulate and change some of the voting there. Now, all of those theories have been debunked. That kind of just shows you where at least a section of the American public is right now when it comes to uh, settling with the outcome of that November's election, Steve. It seems we're seeing after all these elections, a lot of online chatter, not all of it true. Speaking of online chatter, one issue that may not be top of mind for Americans anymore is set to get renewed interest in the coming months. National correspondent Christine Frizzau, tell us why we'll be hearing more about COVID next year. Well, let's remember, Steve, here on Capitol Hill, there has been a House Select subcommittee uh, that's been looking into uh, the COVID pandemic. What are the lessons learned? How do we prevent uh, another pandemic from happening? And, and what did the government get right and what did it get wrong? And I think that a, a lot of people here in Washington think that the government got a lot of things wrong. But uh, Senator Rand Paul, who has been extremely outspoken when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic and the government's response, he uh, told the New York Post this past week that he he is going to head up the Homeland Security Committee on the Senate side and that one of his priorities will be looking into the quote uh, COVID cover-up. Remember, we have seen many, many fights between him and Dr. Anthony Fauci. He, uh, he has argued that through the NIH, gain-of-function research uh, was funded by the U.S. government. It took place in the Wuhan lab. Remember, Wuhan, China is where the COVID virus is believed to have started. He says that he thinks we're closer than ever to getting answers. Of course, that's going to be made very difficult uh, without China's help. China has not been uh, helpful at all. Remember when they did let that team of researchers in from the World Health Organization more than a year after the pandemic started. Uh, it was a tightly controlled visit, and we found out later that, that that team was basically told they're not allowed to talk about the loud leak theory. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, Dr. Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul, thinks that he's going to be able to get somewhere on this next year. So keep an eye out. Christine, Kayla, Matt, great reporting as always. Thank you for your hard work. Back to you. Up next year, running out of gas. What was put in customers' tanks at an Ohio gas station that made their cars come to a stop? And call concerns. A city council meeting in Texas left in disarray during a public comment session. The artificial intelligence used to generate a convincing fake constituent.
This is the National News Desk, America's News. Now, we have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From a warning about potentially bad gas being sold in Ohio to artificial intelligence calling into a city council meeting in Texas, we are taking the pulse of America. But we start in Florida, where the president elect's ties to the state are helping him build out his cabinet. Trump's Mar-a-Lago home has hosted countless top Republicans over the years. The president ran last time as a New Yorker. He's now completely a Florida guy with a Florida team and Florida people around him. And I think lots of his staff was Florida, so I think there'll be a lot of Florida staff along with some of these appointees. It's here where his inner circle has been planning his return to the White House. And as no surprise, he's not had to look far for several key appointments. Political science professor Dr. Aubrey Jewett says it's because Florida has become increasingly Republican and Trump considers it as a prime place to recruit. You get the fact that President Trump knows a lot of these people. He lives here. They're supporting him very strongly and thus he's aware of their capabilities. He's aware of their loyalty. More than a dozen motorists and towing companies flooded social media Sunday about cars being stranded after buying gas at this marathon station along State Route 32 in Williamsburg in unincorporated Brown County. Mount Oreb towing company owner John Arnold says his company towed eight vehicles and that there were more out there. He provided these pictures. Arnold says his mechanic found four gallons of water inside one of the impacted cars. And he says this isn't the first time drivers have had issues with this particular station. This happens, it seems like, every few months or more out there. Station owner Mike Patel declined to go on camera Tuesday. He told me by phone he shut down the pumps as soon as he was informed there may be a problem, saying he didn't want any harm to come to his customers. Patel's having a testing company come out Wednesday to see what's in the gas, and we'll talk more after getting those results. We have one remote speaker, Robin Land. What sounded like a normal caller during public comment at Austin City Hall last Thursday. Hello, esteemed city council. My name is Robin Land. Turned out to be a fraud, programmed to share a dark agenda. Why is everyone acting like just because American bombs are dropped on Gaza that it somehow makes it our fault? The speaker, a self-proclaimed Zionist, continues to make offensive comments before revealing its identity. We have started using an AI software to sign people up. The AI-generated call is now being investigated by city leaders. In a statement posted on the City Council message board Monday, Mayor Watson says in part, We discussed the need to immediately get to the bottom of how this happened, what we can do to prevent it in the future, and how we create security.
What may be your child's favorite Lunchables will no longer be a menu item at schools nationwide. Kraft Heinz says it will remove the meal kits from the National School Lunch Program. The decision comes after Consumer Reports tested school versions of grocery store snacks. The nonprofit organization found high levels of sodium, lead, and cadmium, a chemical element. However, none of the meal kits exceeded any federal limit. Uranus has long been considered to be an outlier in our solar system following the, the one and only fly by of the planet back in 1986. Well, now a deep dive of that data shows that everything we know may actually be wrong. In a new study, astronomers now believe the Voyager 2 may have passed by the planet days after it was affected by an unusual kind of solar weather. They say that solar wind event appears to have caused the magnetosphere to become unusually compressed and if they would have done the flyby a week earlier, they would have completely different results. Fascinating. And that'll be all for us on the weekend edition of the National News Desk, America's News. Now, don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time. Check your local listings. You can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on the nationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of the National News Desk. I'm Dee Gatton, and from all of us here, have a great week.